Well, good evening and welcome to this uh, Bible study. And it's good to be with you again. I'm just going to take a reading from Genesis chapter 37, uh, verses 1 to 10, just to set the scene for these uh, studies, as you can see, on Joseph and the growing in God. And we'll be having a look at Joseph now for a few weeks. And uh, so this will just help us to set the scene. Very well-known verses, uh, but we're going to read them. Genesis chapter 37. And Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with his sons of Bilhah and Zilphah, the, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colours. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you now as we stand before your word and we ask that you will help us to understand something uh, which will help us to grow in our walk with you. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So Joseph is known as one of the good guys in the Bible. That's how one commentator spoke about him. But who was Joseph? And he had a, a, initially a troubled life, uh, but he set forth really as a great example to us from uh, which we can learn much uh, for us today. Now, as we look at Joseph over the next few weeks, I want to split his life and our lives into three areas. Youth, middle age, and old age. And uh, I see how we, what we can learn from Joseph, which will help us as we continue to grow in God. So who was Joseph? Well, we see there from uh, Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 to 24, that Rachel, that's his mother, conceived and bore a son. And she said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. The word, the name Joseph means he adds. And uh, she was uh, looking to have another son. Uh, Joseph was her first. And uh, of course, we know the story of Jacob and how he met Rachel and how all the intrigue that went on in the life of Jacob and Rachel and how he was eventually married. She was the one that he really loved. She was the one that he wanted to marry. He was tricked, wasn't he, into marrying her sister. Um, and so this was the, the child that Jacob wanted, the son from Rachel. <clears throat> now, in the complexities of the Old Testament story, as we see throughout Genesis, we find out and discover that Jacob had three other wives and 11 other sons. But Joseph, it says, was the son of his old age, and by Rachel, and he was the favourite, the favourite child. Now, the story is set about 1910 BCE. It's a tale of tragedy, of joy, of injustice, of patience, of faith, and of divine providence. Very little is known of his childhood from that reading there in Genesis 30, up until the reading that we just took from Genesis 37. 
Uh, and it's there he appears on the stage, if you like, at the age of 17. And it's at this point where the story of Joseph becomes so intriguing. What we read of, and as we read those verses from chapter 37, is this, that Joseph, uh, who it appears had a, a rather challenged relationship with his brothers, it says that he was out with them as they were looking after the sheep. That was the family business. His brothers were the shepherds. It says that he brought a bad report back to his father and told on them. We don't know what it was, uh, but something they'd done he didn't like. And he decided that he was going to tell his father about his brothers. And so he did. Then we also read in that same section that Joseph, uh, sorry, Jacob made Joseph. Uh, it's called a, a coat of many colors. Uh, that's probably a slightly a mistranslation. It probably should be a tunic with long sleeves. And uh, what was the importance of this tunic, this long sleeve tunic? Well, it was a sign of people who were of the richer classes. And so Jacob was saying to, 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 to Joseph, I'm giving you this garment because you are somebody different. You are somebody special. And actually what it really meant was this, that he was exempt from any menial tasks, especially farming or shepherding. And so here we have the situation where his brothers who were shepherds see this young boy at 17 years of age given this special gift by his father and his father is basically saying look Joseph you don't need to be a shepherd you don't no need to go and do all these menial tasks you can just relax <laughs> you can just enjoy the life I've provided for you so you can understand if you like why his brothers hated him he was the favorite and they became jealous. Uh, they became angry at this young lad. Then, of course, the final straw comes with those dreams. The dreams that we read about there in chapter 37. Joseph is portrayed in these dreams as the ruler. The one to whom both his father, his mother, and all of his brothers would bow down to him sometime in the future. They would show him reverence and submission. And so that was the straw, if you like, that, that broke the brothers back. And it was because of that, that as we'll see later on, uh, that he is sold into slavery. Finally, they just couldn't take any more of this boy. Uh, this young upstart, he was, he was a nuisance to them. He wasn't like one of them. He was different to them all. And he was spoiled by his father. But how do we learn about growing in God from Joseph, the young man? Joseph, the young man of 17, who had this rather mixed up problem with his family, bad relationships with his brother, issues with his mother and father of favoritism, which were all causing all sorts of problems and difficulties. Well, I want to just start with Joseph as a young man. And I want to suggest that as a young man, Joseph, first of all, was immature. And, uh, but probably as well, we might say he was slightly impetuous. It says, doesn't it, that Joseph had a dream. It's there in chapter 37, we've already read it. This is just a summary of those few verses. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. When he told it to his father, his father rebuked him. And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the sayings in mind. Here we see Joseph as a 17-year-old, an immature, even impetuous young man. He'd had these two dreams illustrating his future role and his future power. Now, if it was me, I would have suggested to Joseph that he kept quiet about it. That perhaps he just thought about it, thought it through, wondered what it was all about. And then gone and spoken quietly to his father. Asked for his father's advice. But no, jo Joseph doesn't do that. He jumps in feet first. He tells his brother, he tells his father, these are the dreams that I've had and this is what's going to happen. You are all going to bow down to me. And of course we see that shocked by his impetuous action and his immaturity, uh, Jacob rebukes him. 
However, I, I am almost challenged by that last phrase there. It says in those verses, but his father kept the sayings in mind. In other words, although he rebuked him, he, he was very conscious of the words that Joseph had told him. And have you ever wondered why? Well, of course, if you think about Jacob, you will know that Jacob was not unaware of God speaking to him in dreams. Remember Jacob's ladder, the, the great ladder that went up from earth to heaven with the angels of God ascending and descending on it? Jacob knew what it was to encounter God in a different way. He wrestled with him at, at the Jabbok. He knew that God was able to speak to people through these dreams. And so, I'm sure that's why Jacob kept these things in his mind. And if only Joseph had just gone to him and said, Dad, what, what should I do here? It's lovely, isn't it, to be able to go to somebody and say, well, Dad, or uh, to a trusted friend, pastor, whatever, what should I do here in this particular situation? The other thing that we can also just mention here in passing, I think, is we might also assume that Jacob should have known better about the whole issue of showing favoritism. Favoritism is not a good thing to be shown uh, in, in life or particularly in church life. Remember what had happened when Rebecca, his mother, had shown him favoritism in order that he might get the blessing from his father Isaac. It ended up in a complete family breakdown, didn't it? And he had to flee for his life from his brother Esau. And so you'd think that, Jacob, well, you know what favoritism can do. You know the situation and the difficulties. Why are you treating your son Joseph like this? But of course, the human element came in again. And, and, and he loved him because he was the daughter, uh, the son, sorry, of Rachel, his favorite wife. And so here we have, uh, I would say, a mixed up family situation. We would call it today in, in the modern uh, 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 terminology, a dysfunctional family. You have a husband, four wives, uh, 12 sons and a daughter, and they're all, <laughs> they're all against each other. And so you have all this happening. And Joseph at the time is probably the youngest. Benjamin also comes along, doesn't he? But he's one of the youngest. Just him and Benjamin, they are the youngest too. And he's there and he's in the middle of all of this. And as a young man, Joseph just shows his immaturity. You just sit and you think, well, what was he trying to do? Was he trying to achieve something? Was he trying to get one over on his brothers? What, what was it that he was trying to do? Do you know, often as young or immature Christians and immature believers... We can be a lot like Joseph, can't we? We can speak before we think. We think because we've got saved, because we've read a bit of the Bible, we know all the answers. And we have the answers that God wants for every situation. But you know, friends, it's so important that we learn as Christians, as immature believers, that we learn to wait. I say perhaps Joseph should have kept quiet, but immaturity often will cause us to speak in haste. What does um, James say about this? He says, well, you need to learn to listen. That's such an important factor in our Christian life. He says in James chapter 1, 19 to 22, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And so here he's, he's telling us how it's important that we learn to listen carefully before speaking out as Christians. Remember here he says we are brothers or we are brethren. We have a new nature. That's one of the th key themes through the book of James. We have this new nature. We are brothers. We are brethren. We are part of the family of God. And he says you have a new nature because of that. You should learn to listen. Don't be quick to speak out. Because if you are, you can cause all sorts of problems. You can cause anger in particular. He says, learn to listen. Adopt a new way of speaking. It's interesting. I was recently talking to somebody who is involved in counselling. And she was telling me the art of counselling is to learn the art of listening. Not the art of speaking. <laughs> and how important it is that we learn to listen. Now, what is James talking about here? 
Well, he's actually talking about listening to the word of God, first of all. He says in the next verses 21 and 22, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, what James is saying here is, first of all, you need to listen to the word of God. How important that is, he says, receive the word of God. That's what's going to save your soul. He says, but do the word of God. When you hear it, put it into practice. And that's so important in our lives as Christian. See, it's important because the word of God is the final arbitrator in all issues that we have in our lives as Christians. We have to live in a biblical manner. And that's why we have to take everything that we do everything that we say, and we have to check it out with the Word of God. Does it stand true to the foundations of the Word of God? If it does, then it's okay. If it doesn't, then it must be put to one side and forgotten about. And so James is saying, look, he says, listen to the Word of God first. He says, and then put it into practice. Because as we listen to the Word of God, and as we allow the Word of God to work on us, it will change us. It will alter who we are and how we act. And then he says, then this affects how we learn to listen to other people, how we interact with other people. And you say, well, how, how, does you, how do you get that out of this verse, these verses in James? Well, it's because he talks about creating anger. He says, if you don't listen properly, first of all, to the word of God, and then to other people, you can produce anger within other people. And he says, you don't want that. We don't want anger. Remember what it said there? He says, be, be, person, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And that's what we, we don't want anger. We want righteousness. And so that's what James is saying. He's saying, make sure that you listen to the word of God and that you listen to other people, because if you don't, it can cause trouble. It will cause possibility of anger in your lives. Young Christian, immature believer, don't know what stage you are at in your development, but this is good uh, advice for all of us, whatever, however long we've been on the road of Christianity and faith. Learn to wait before you speak. Learn to check out what the Word of God says. Seek to mature in the things of God. What does Paul say about this in Ephesians 4? Again, just a summary of those lovely verses. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. He says, this is the goal of our maturity, okay? And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. So first of all, Paul says that these people are put in the church, these leaders are put in the church in order to equip everybody in the church. And he goes on to say why. We are being equipped to work, to do works of service or ministry. But then he goes on and says, until we all attain to mature manhood so that we may no longer be children. So you notice here how Paul is saying the goal is that we mature. That should be our goal, maturity, that we, we move on from being children in our faith, immature, young, that we become mature and he uses the term manhood or adulthood, so that we have grown to some kind of maturity in our lives. What a contrast. That is a contrast, isn't it, between a child and a mature person. The, ch the contrast in how we think, how we act, how we speak, how we conduct ourselves. And so what he's saying is this. He says we must grow spiritually just as we grow naturally. And we could talk about that. We could talk about the whole subject of spiritual growth. It's such an important issue that we need to be committed to. Can I challenge you today? How committed are you to learning the Word of God? How committed are you to reading the Word of God? To hearing it preached? Remember what Paul says here. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or, or the pastors and the teachers. They are there to explain the word of God to us so that we are equipped. And so we must have that desire, first of all, to be, want to be equipped. And he says, everything is in place for you to be equipped 
if you will just listen to the word of God being taught, you will read the word of God and then you will apply it to your lives. Friends, there's no better foundation for us in our lives than that which is the word of God. And we have to have that great foundation in order that we might live, but also that we might know how to respond to others. <clears throat> how important it is that we build on foundations. The writer of the Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11, through to chapter 6, verse 1 and verse 2, actually, as well. Uh, if you have the time, just read that full section there. It's, it's a very illuminating section of, of, of Scripture. But the writer there says, For though by this time... You ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles. What was happening with the Hebrew church, the Hebrew Christians that we see there in the book of Hebrews, is that they had come out of Judaism. They had come out of the old religion of Judaism. They had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And what the writer is saying, he says, you haven't grown. You haven't developed in your faith. You've taken on, and there are six <clears throat> basic principles that he mentions in those verses which is so important. He says, uh, we, we, you've, we don't have the, uh, the, lay again the foundations of repentance from dead works, of faith, of instructions about washings, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. He says they are the, the six basic fundamental issues, if you like, of our Christian faith. He says that's what you saw when you came out of Judaism and into Christianity. You saw how important those issues were. But he says, you need to move on from that. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. He says, those things are all very basic. They're all very elementary issues. And what we have to do is seek to grow in spiritual maturity, to recognize our limitations, and to pursue that deeper knowledge of God. Move on from your initial understanding that led to the salvation of your soul. From those six basic things, let's just recap them. Repentance, okay, that's the, that's the starting point, isn't it? And faith. Instructions about washings, well, uh, there's, there's a number of things that that could be, but is it possibly a reference to baptism? Your initial baptism when you come to faith. Then of laying on of hands, which... Uh, generally in the New Testament and the Old Testament spoke of commission into service, but here could well be uh, relating to our interaction and receiving of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then of the resurrection of the dead, that great goal that we all look forward to, that we will be raised with Christ. And then, of course, the eternal judgment. We know that the day is coming when God will judge the earth. And so he says, they are the basic fundamentals. But he said, we need to go deeper now. You need to press on and go deeper into your understanding of the word of God. But he says, you have to have the desire to grow. You must have that desire. And then he says, but allow God to move you. Allow God to, to, to press you, to develop you in your spiritual maturity by following those spiritual disciplines that we should all follow in our lives. Friends, we cannot achieve spiritual maturity on our own. It's not something that we can set out to do. It's something that we have to allow the Lord to take over our lives and to fit us and to equip us and to grow us in him that we might go forward in him and in our strength and in our faith. See, today we have to realize that we all start out as immature believers, don't we? Just like Joseph. Joseph started out his life, he was a child, a young man, and he was immature. And perhaps he said a few things that he shouldn't have said. And perhaps with hindsight, uh, we could look back and say, well, you know, he should have kept quiet. But how often have we been like that? even more mature Christians. You know, I sometimes stop and I sometimes think and I, I look back at things that I've done and things that I've said and I regret them. And I say, oh, if only I hadn't done that. And friends, you know, the honest, honesty is so important and how important it is to go back and if we have offended people, that we go and deal with it and we, we, we apologize and we sort those kind of issues out. But you know, we're all, we can all be immature. And we can all say things that perhaps we might regret in uh, later life. 
But let's focus our minds not so much on our immaturity, but on our desire to mature so that we might grow in God. The second thing that we want, I just want to leave with you this evening regarding Joseph is this, that although Joseph was immature as a young man, he remained pure. Genesis chapter 39, verses uh, 7 to 9. You know what happened in the story. And uh, we come to the situation where Joseph had been sold into slavery, hadn't he? He was just a young man, uh, 17, 18 years of age, whatever it was, something like that. He's sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. He ends up in, in Egypt and he is employed as a slave in the house of Potiphar. And we'll talk more about him uh, about Potiphar's household uh, as we go into further weeks. But just for now, find this situation. This young man, he's away from home. He's serving this very important man. He was the chief of the captain of the guard. He was in charge of, uh, of Pharaoh's personal bodyguard. Uh, he would have been a very high-flying man in society of Egypt at that time. And here's Joseph. This young 17, 18-year-old boy, however old, around about that age he was, and he's there in this house serving as the main servant. And actually, he becomes quite a favourite, and he takes on the role of leading the house, the household. Uh, he's got quite a good job, actually, even though he's a slave. His boss, Potiphar, um, entrusts him with the whole of the house. He says, you can look after anything. Anything you say in this house goes. You are in charge. Along comes Mrs. Potiphar. <laughs> and uh, this, this woman, she is attracted to Joseph. And she ad makes advances to him, sexual advances to him. And she wants him to sleep with him, with her. Now think about this. Here we have a young man, late teenager. He could have gratified all his physical desires in that moment as a young man. I'm sure that there are temptations in the world. Well, I know there are temptations in the world. And I'm sure that as a young man, that would have been a great temptation to Joseph. The opportunity to go and sleep with this, this, this woman. But notice what it says. Again, this is a summary of those verses. After a time, his master's wife cast her eye on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And so here we are. We have this young man who not so very long ago was immature, was impetuous, was getting under the skin of his, his family, especially his brothers, and his father was a bit upset about the whole situation. However, he goes to this foreign land. He's away from home. There's nobody around who knows him. He's on his own, and this woman just offers himself to her, herself to him. And what does he do? He says no. He says no. He says my purity is more important than any physical satisfaction. And notice what he says. He says, if I do this, he says, I sin against God. So he wasn't even thinking about the implications of what would happen to what Potiphar would have to say about it if he found out, or the fact that this was a married woman. He said, this is wrong in the eyes of God. And friends, you know, there are so many temptations in the world today, things which are wrong in the eyes of God that Christians are getting involved in. And we shouldn't, we should hold back from them. And I can assure you of this, one of the biggest issues is sexual temptation and sexual sin. And I think here that Joseph shows us such a good example of how to stay pure to keep ourselves pure, because we have to remember that when we're involved in any of these kind of things, we are sinning against God. It is God is the one who is ultimately sinned against. Just cast your mind a bit further on in history of, the, of Israel. Remember David? What happened to David? It says that he saw Bathsheba as she was bathing, 
And he looked at her and he said, nice woman. And he went to her. And he had committed adultery with her. David failed in this particular issue. Yes, he repented. We know that. Read Psalm 51. He repented and, and got back on track. But, you know, friends, not everyone gets it right. But Joseph did. Joseph knew what was right and what was wrong. And he would not give in to this woman's advances. He knew that the boss's wife was off limits to him. One of the concerns that I have, and it's becoming more and more apparent the more I read and watch and talk to people, is that we hear very little these days about holiness and purity in the church. The emphasis seems to be upon excitement, enjoyment, uh, about being like the world, so that we can attract people. And I've heard people say, well, we, we want to show the world that we are no different from them, that we are just like them. And so we don't need to have those standards, those biblical standards, those old-fashioned standards. Friends, it's wrong. That is a totally wrong attitude. We are different. We are called to be different. We are saved by grace. We have been changed. We are supposed to have put off the old nature with its sin and with its self-indulgence and to have put on the new nature, which is Christ. We are not trying to attract people to ourselves. We are trying to attract people to a holy life in Jesus Christ because that is so important that they receive the gospel, which is the only means of salvation. Friends, we must be different from the world because we must be Christ-like. We have come out of the kingdom of darkness, which is the world, and we have come into the kingdom of light, which is the light of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And friends, there is no greater difference than something which is dark and something which is light. Friends, as Christians, we are to be different. We are to seek holiness. We are to seek after purity. Yes, friends, we do slip. And yes, we do get things wrong. And yes, we do make mistakes. But thank God we have a God who is a forgiving God who says, I'll give you a second chance. Just like he did for David. Friends, we must be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wasn't like the world. Yes, he interacted with the world, but he wasn't like the world. He was different because it says he knew no sin. He was holy, the holy one. Can I say this this evening, that a gospel that presents no challenge to change of one's attitudes, actions, and desires is no gospel at all. I can say that again because I think it's important. A gospel that presents no challenge to change one's attitudes, actions, and desires is no gospel at all. Holiness or being set apart or purity is a divine standard that we cannot afford to lose sight of in our lives. This is what the Word of God says, why holiness and purity are essential Christian virtues. This is what Peter says. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What a standard we have. Our standard is none other than God himself who has called us. The holy God. And he says, you be holy, for I am holy. Yes, he does say, you were don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance or of your former manner of life. And so by using that very word former, Peter is already suggesting a change. He says, this is what you used to be like. He says, you used to be in these passions, in your ignorance. Formerly, you were like that. He says, but now you've been called by a holy God and you should be holy. You should seek after purity and holiness in God. He goes on then, doesn't he, in the next chapter, talking about holiness and purity. 1 Peter 2, 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house 
to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Wow, what a huge difference that is. He says, this is what you are. You are spiritual. You are holy. And you are, ex- you are offering things which are acceptable to God. Just consider this the, as, you, as you stop and think about these verses. Is what you are doing acceptable to Jesus Christ? Is how you are living as a so-called Christian acceptable to God through Jesus Christ? Is what you are doing for the sake of the gospel acceptable to God? Friends, we need to know that we've been changed. That yes, we had a former manner of life. And we are different. Because that leads to a completely different life perspective. It leads to a completely different life priority and to our life practices because when we see what we were and when we see what we are we should see a difference and friends I want to say this to you today I believe that those in the world should see a difference as well the church has become in many instances nothing more than a social club And we are not attracting people to the truth of the gospel. So let's go back to Joseph. Joseph is this young man. He's immature. And so you say to me, Chris, you're kind of contradicting yourself here. You're saying, well, he was immature in one hand, and yet in this issue of purity, he seemed very mature. And he really had it together with this whole issue. How can a young person be two things? It's quite simple. Listen to this. We have a a reason for being a holy example. Another young man in the Bible is Timothy. I love the books of Timothy and Titus, but Timothy in particular. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy, a young man, probably a little bit older than Joseph was in his day. But here, Timothy may have been about 30 years of age, which I can assure you is young. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Paul gives him this advice. He says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believer as an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. See, what Paul says is even as a young, immature Christian, even as a young man, a young woman, you can still be an example in how you speak, in how you conduct yourself, in how you love God and how you love others, in how you believe and live in faith, and in your purity. He says, all of these things, you, Timothy, can be an example. And I want to echo those words and say, listen, people of Newbridge, listen, Christians, however old you are, however young you are, however immature you are in your faith, or mature you are in your faith, you can still be an example to other believers. Joseph was. And Joseph was an example in the land of Egypt, where nobody else was interested in his God, where nobody else knew him. Do you know, sometimes we can be examples when we're in church, can't we? We can be good examples when we're with fellow Christians, when we're talking to the pastor, or when we're talking to one of the leaders in the church or somebody else. We can be the perfect example. But when we get outside, when we go home, we are a completely different person. That's not what it is. See, when Joseph was on his own, when he was there on his own, that revealed the true character of the boy. Yes, he was alone. He was tempted. But he knew that the people of God remain pure. What do you like when you're on your own? What do you like when you face temptation? Do you rely on God? Timothy, Paul said, you can be an example. You can be an example in how you live, act, and conduct yourself. You can be an example as well in your faith and your love. How important it is that we are good examples. And why do we want this holiness? Why do we want to be examples of holiness? Well, listen to what Hebrews 12 says and verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's a challenge, isn't it? That's a challenge. First of all, striving for peace with everyone. That's the first challenge. And then he says, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And so if we haven't got that holiness, if we do not know that holiness, if we do not know that holy life and that holy living, 
we're not going to see the Lord. The kind of implications that that can have on us are absolutely tremendous. In other words, we must want to stand before God and be accepted into his holy kingdom, to be seen to have his righteousness, to be seen to have his holiness, and that we have lived a life which is true to the gospel, which is true to the biblical narrative. He says, if you haven't got that holiness, if you haven't received that holiness from God, then you are not going to see God in the end times. How important it is that we strive after purity. Just as Joseph, Joseph remained pure in spite of the fact that he was immature and at times even impetuous. I just want to show you one last slide. I just want to show you six lessons that we can learn from the story of Joseph as we talk about immaturity, yet pure. Yet pure. Immature, yet pure. First of all, all disciples begin as immature believers. Remember that. Nobody is the finished article. We all start off from scratch. Secondly, though, all disciples should desire to grow in God. You have to have that inner desire to grow in God. Then, as we read in James, all disciples should apply the word of God to their lives in order to help them grow in maturity. Then, fourthly, it is essential that all disciples should pursue holiness and purity. And that doesn't mean just not doing certain things. That means seeking to be more like Jesus. Fifthly, all disciples should stand for the truth. Joseph knew that that woman's advances were not right. And he stood for the truth. And then finally, I suggest that all disciples should strive to be good examples of the faith. So Joseph, yes, he was a young man with perhaps a difficult, if not even a tempestuous home life. But what he does do, he illustrates that we all start off as immature Christians, but we can remain pure. In other words, we can be, remain worthy of the calling to which we have been called in Christ. But not only that, he illustrates, and we will see this as we go on over the next couple of weeks, that how important it is for those of us who begin the path begin on the path of the Christian faith, that we strive to grow in maturity. Next time, God willing, we'll move to Joseph in middle age and see what lessons we can learn from him when he's down in Egypt. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your help today. And we pray that indeed you will help us to be those people you would have us to be, to live pure and holy lives based on the word of God, serving you. And Lord, we pray that we will all strive to know you more, to know you in a greater way, and to live for you in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We ask your blessing upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen.